Okay, so it's kind of a long chapter, so let's, uh, let's read through chapter 7, and we'll uh, take a look at a few things afterwards. And so like I said, chapter 7 is a continuation of what happened in chapter 6. So just reading the uh, last few verses of chapter 6, we'll go into chapter 7. So uh, in chapter 6, in verse uh, 13, it says, They put forward false witnesses and said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that the Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the custom which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Chapter 7, And the high priest said, Are these things so? And so in verse 2, Stephen begins, And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia and before he lived in Haran, and said to me, or said to him, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran, and from there, after his father died, God removed him into this country in which you are now living, and he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, and yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be aliens in a foreign land, that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they shall be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. And yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions, and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there passed away he and our fathers. And from there they were removed to Shechem, and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt, until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. And it was at this time that Moses was born. He was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. After he had been exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him away nurtured him as her own son. And Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You do not mean to kill me, as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? And at this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. And after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. And when Moses saw it, he began to marvel at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their groans, and I have come down to deliver them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? 
is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses, Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him in Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. And our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. And at the time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol, and they were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices. Forty years in, in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god of Rumpha and the images which you made to worship them. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with the Joshua upon dispossession of the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man sitting or standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven, driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robe at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen. As he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold his sin against him. And having said this, he fell asleep. What Stephen just said to them, I'm sure to them, was quite insulting, but it was the truth. But Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was speaking the truth. Some hard words that he laid out there for them. It was almost like a thunderstorm that just formed right after that moment. When I was in the, taking meteorology classes, they they started describing how that happens. When, when thunderstorms uh, start forming, it, it's just this, you, you have so many different elements that are taking place and they start, things start separating. And, and when you have, they start talking about static electricity and, and they, what the diagram showed was uh, pluses and minuses, you know, and in stable atmosphere, they just kind of, uh, you know, comfortably mixed together, no problem at all. And then when a thunderstorm happens, they just polarize. You have the pluses and the minuses do this, and this is where you just get that high energy taking place. And this is almost like what happened here. Man, that, that just separated them out. Their response to what Stephen had just said, there was no, no mistaking about how they felt about what what Stephen had just said. They were instantly raging at Stephen. And amazingly, you see that in verse 54, they were cut to the quick, they began gnashing their teeth at him, and so you, you have the camera pan over to these guys, they're just about to, to jump all over Stephen, and the next thing is they show Stephen, and here's Stephen, 
he's looking up into heaven. And he says, I saw the glory of God and, I, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he says it out loud. You know, he, he's saying this stuff out loud. And all the people that were around him, the, the religious leaders there, they, what they do is they cried out with a loud voice and they cover their ears. And they rush upon Stephen. And they drive him out of the city. And they begin stoning him. What imagery that moment must have been. From the point of where, before, right before he answered, Chase had shown like an angel. And then Stephen goes into a five to ten minute history lesson, not to lecture them, but to bring them understanding. And then from that point, it brought them to the point of, you are guilty of this. And their response was, that's it, Stephen. This is game over for you. We are taking you out, and we're going to do it right now. There's going to be no more questioning. There's going to be no more response from you. And I can imagine that things happen very quickly. From verse 54 down on, I can't imagine that took very long to do. As angry as they were at Stephen, they drag him out of the city. The ones doing the, doing the uh, stoning, they, they lay the coats at the feet of Saul, or who has become Paul, who is witnessing this whole thing. You can just see the Stephen being brought out. He's outside the city gates. And everybody's just rushing behind him. All of the anger that's taking place with the religious leaders, they're going after him. And there's all these other people that are joining in. And there's Paul, or Saul at the time, standing there. It, so much so is that it records it that Apparently, it was noticeable that he was there watching this take place. Never heard of this guy before until now. You ever notice that? Everything leading up to here, and all of a sudden, Saul is standing there. Saul is watching. The people are throwing rocks at Stephen. Stephen is in the middle of all of this. He's taking it. Stephen is calling out, Jesus to receive his spirit, he realizes that his time is very, very short. Jesus is standing. You know, it's funny, we had a, when I was reading up on this, it, oftentimes it's, it's spoken of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And when Stephen looked up, Jesus was standing. And it's almost kind of like when somebody's coming home or somebody comes into your house, right? You stand up. It's kind of like that in the military. If somebody important comes into the room, everybody comes and stands up. And not saying, not elevating Stephen beyond Jesus, but at least looking at the fact that, wow, you know, Jesus was there standing. Stephen falls to his knees and he says not to hold the sin against him. And that was it for Stephen. Two chapters in the book of Acts. We see this person move from an obscure money distributor to the poor widows and the poor people of the congregation to the first Christian to die for being a Christian. It's not because he wore the Christian shirt or had the right stickers. It was how he lived and what he said. That was just a short amount of time. Two chapters. There's three things here. The truth can be threatening. Now, I think we've heard the saying before that the truth hurts. Someone tells you there's mustard on your dress shirt. You don't necessarily want to hear it. However, you do want to verify to see if that's correct. But then you don't want to fall for some sort of trick. Or when you're waiting for the smog test on your car and wondering, <laughs> is it going to pass? Or when you get news from the dentist about your x-rays that they just took, 
You know, these kinds of things cause me anxiety. And you know, I know they shouldn't because it just sounds like a ridiculous thing. There's much bigger things in the world to be concerned about, but yet here I am. I know I shouldn't feel like it is a test, but I feel like, oh my goodness, I need to pass. I start getting stressed out for my vehicle that's, you know, doing the small test right now. Come on, you can do it, buddy. Just hang in there. And in all three of those things, the, the truth will be revealed. I could go to a mirror and look and see if, in fact, there is mustard on my shirt. And that mirror will reveal the truth to me. When you get that print out from the smog station, if you can even understand it at all, all you're looking for is, okay, what's the state limits, and did I exceed them or not? And if I didn't, whew, I get my car for another, another two more years. When a dentist walks in, and he has that look on his face, and you just know, oh man, another appointment, huh? <laughs> You're going to come in and start doing things to my teeth that uh, I, I'm not agreeable to. However, I know it needs to be done. The truth is hard. It's unyielding, which is why we must always yield to it. Instead, look at how the, these, uh, these religious guys responded. These are the high priests here. Anybody should be looking for Jesus. It should be them. If anybody knew the scriptures and should know how these things were to work out, it should be them. That is, if they were looking for Jesus. And that's the question. I don't know if they were. I really can't speak for them, but it just doesn't seem like they were. Doesn't it kind of amazing? Here's Stephen. He's given this almost a brief summary of what the Old Testament is from Abraham to the prophets. And he's really not, the detail that he gives is, is pretty striking. He, he knows all the way down to when Moses was born and what happened to, to the infants at the time and what happened to Moses, even to the point of what happened to Moses when he struck down that Egyptian. There's some very specific details in there that Stephen knew. And obviously he was filled with the Holy Spirit, but maybe he was the guy that was always, you know, doing the, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you game about, uh, about Israel history. <laughs> so, you know, what, what did Moses do that really got people mad when he was 40 years old? <laughs> Everybody's trying to think, and gotcha. <laughs> Here, let me tell you the answer. I don't know, we don't really know that much about him from a, from a personal standpoint because he just showed up in chapter 6. But you look at how these religious leaders responded. And Stephen nails it in verse 50, 51. They resisted the Holy Spirit. And then in their physical actions in 57, in verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and they covered their ears. Can't you just see these guys? When Stephen is saying, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they're doing this. No! I don't even want to hear you say that, Stephen. Nothing more tragic than that. Truth can be threatening. Truth is hard. If you do not yield to it, it is a threat. And to these religious leaders, their response was, I'm just going to cover my ears. Number two, the truth can save you. Have you ever hesitated at a green light and then a car goes roaring through the one that had just turned red? I've done that. For some reason, you pause and you don't really know why, and all of a sudden, you and you think, goodness, <laughs> I would have been a bug on that windshield. <clears throat> They would have just found, you know, bits and pieces of my glasses, and that, and that would have been it. And, you know, it's, it's, this is how much I trust people nowadays. I, when the, my light turns green, guess what? I still wait probably about a second to look to make sure nobody's coming through. Or on a one-way street, guess what? I still look both ways because it's happened. I've crossed a one-way street, and now it's just about to cross, and somebody was coming down the wrong direction, and I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> they have signs. You have traffic signals. You think you can trust them. The reason I do this, the reason that I take that pause, the reason that I look both ways on a one-way street, is I am looking out for what is reality. What is true? 
just because the sign says one way or just because my light says green and theirs says red does not mean that that's actually what's going to happen. And so I am looking to see if a, is a car coming or not, despite what the sign says. God is reality. You look to Him to see how things really are. And then we realize that we're not good enough. And it's like Peter said to Jesus. Remember when he was talking to Jesus? And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinner. But Jesus didn't depart, thank goodness, and he doesn't depart from us. Then it makes sense to us why Jesus is coming. There was a guy named Saul that was there. He wasn't saved that day. You have to wonder if this event stuck in his mind, though. For weeks after Jesus left and, and the Holy Spirit came, more and more people were becoming saved because the truth was being spoken. People saw what was true, and they wanted it for themselves. There was no more lies by the devil. You don't need to... And this is what he does. This is what the devil does, right? You don't need God. You know, find that perfect job. Find that perfect home. Find the perfect spouse. Find the perfect this. Find the perfect that. And it's the trick of the devil and that he knows you will never find anything perfect like that on earth because it doesn't exist, at least in what we're after. But it doesn't prevent him from throwing this out there to us, and we get in this endless cycle of chasing things, and it's just never satisfying, it's never fulfilling, and nobody's ever able to measure up to it. And he just sits there with his hands crossed like that, saying, yeah, it's just like watching somebody going round and round and round on a roller coaster. <laughs> Man, they're so easy to fool, and I bet I am easy to fool. But when you come into contact with your reality, and God is reality, and God is truth. When you come in contact with that, you realize that everything that Satan has ever done to you has been to trick you and to lie to you. And the truth is so comforting. And it's so Satan too. Because it just doesn't sit there and say, okay, here's the truth. Now, just look at it. No, it's not that. The truth comes inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And that leads us to number three. The truth will change you. I'm sure Stephen saw the looks on their faces. I'm sure when he was standing there, and as he was giving out these words, and when it ended with some of the, uh, the hard truth that he was telling him that, hey, you know what, it was your fathers who killed the prophets, and you were the ones that killed Jesus, I'm sure the looks on their faces just started to change. And they could, he could see the anger, and he could see the rage in their eyes, and they were just probably waiting for Stephen to finish because they just couldn't wait to pull him out of there. He was the recipient of their impulsive anger, and yet here he is, just like Jesus. Remember what Jesus said on the cross? Father, forgive them. You don't know what they're doing. Here's Stephen. I just, see, that's what just still blows me away. And that's the part where I just, I sit there and I, every time I read stuff like this, I always put myself in that situation. I'm like, that's, a, that's amazing. That is an amazing thing to say when somebody is hurling chunks of rock at you. And I'm not picturing these little tiny pebble stones that you get at Lowe's. I'm, I'm picturing, they're kind of like chunks of concrete, you know, that are broken up. People are lifting them up with both hands and just going after you with them. And all the while that's taking place, all that anger that's directed towards Stephen, this is what he says? That's the last thing that he says? His last words are, let's read it. Falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The only truth that can change somebody like that is God. There's no other, no other thing that can do that. Yoga can't do that for you. Yoda from Star Wars can't do that to you. The Force can't do it for you. No self-help book can do it for you. You will not see anything like this in there. I can guarantee you that. Because it looks like weakness, doesn't it? It looks like it, but it's not. I think Stephen was thinking, you know, as long as 
these people still have a breath. They still have a chance. And that's how I know it. Everything that Stephen had said up to that point, it wasn't to sit there and go, I finally got you. I got the stage now. Now I'm really going to run you guys around. No, it wasn't that. The purpose was, man, they still have a chance. They still have a chance to turn. If I can just convince them of it. If I can just show them, here's what you're talking about when you're talking about Moses and the law. And here's Jesus. And here's how it's connected. Now all of this that you're hoping for back here, it was imperfection. It wasn't good enough. As a matter of fact, they were killing the messengers of God. That's what it was. And you killed Jesus. And that just... And just, you can see the response. They just, they didn't want to hear it. But Stephen's response towards the end was still hoping. Man, I hope they, I hope they turn. You know what Paul said when he got to heaven and found Stephen? Think about that. You think that sticks in Paul's mind? You know, during, I wonder if he could just get that thing out of his head, what he saw with Stephen. He's standing there watching all this taking place. You would think if somebody's getting beat up like Stephen is, the proper thing to do would be to step in and try to protect him or pull him out of there, get him out of harm's way, because there's really nothing Stephen did that was deserving of death, even though the religious leaders were counting it as something like that. They were acting on impulse from there on out in the last part, but nobody was jumping in to, to save him. And there's Paul just watching this take place. Gosh, now, why is he doing and then the last words he says, Man, man don't, don't hold it against the Lord. I wonder if that just sat there. I mean, I'm speculating now, but was Paul, was that going through his head? Oftentimes, man, when Paul writes many times, me, the worst, the wretched man that I am. You know, these last words of Stephen are truly amazing, and you can't fake stuff like that. And these are what the people of the kingdom of God look like.